Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Inga Lotz? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Inga Lotz was born in Pretoria, South Africa, on March 9, 1983. Her father, Jan, was a professor of radiology. Her mother, Juanita, was a physiotherapist. Inga performed well in school. She earned a bachelor's degree and was working on a master's degree in statistics. Because it becomes important to this story, I want to talk for a moment about the murder rate in South Africa. South Africa is a challenging place as far as remaining alive. It has the fifth highest murder rate in the world. El Salvador claims the highest murder rate, then Honduras, Venezuela, Jamaica, and South Africa. The murder rate is 33.5 murders per 100,000 people. The average for the world is 6.1. By way of comparison, here are the murder rates for a few other countries. The United States, 6.3. Canada has a murder rate of 2, United Kingdom 1.2, Australia 0.9, and Switzerland's murder rate is 0.5. Every year in South Africa, about 20,000 people are murdered, which is about the same quantity as the United States, despite South Africa having only 59 million people compared to 329 million people in the United States. Not even 18% of the population, but 100%. Of the murders. One can make an argument that, statistically, South Africa is indistinguishable from a war zone. Now returning to Inga's background. In November 2004, Inga started dating a man named Fred Vandeviver. He was from a wealthy family. He grew up on a tomato and cattle farm. Like Inga, Fred performed well academically. He was taking college courses as he worked for an insurance company in Cape Town. He rented an apartment in Cape Town with a friend of his named Marius Batha. The relationship between Fred and Inga was not stable. Fred belonged to a church referred to as His People Church, which had strict teachings about relationships between men and women. The church did not believe in premarital sex or any physical contact which might tempt people to have sex before marriage. Fred and Inga followed these rules. The way Fred interpreted the teachings led him to become controlling, demanding, and possessive. The couple had many disagreements and arguments. Despite all the problems in the relationship, the couple was planning on getting married someday. Near the end of February 2005, Inga moved into a two-bedroom apartment on a wine estate just outside Stellenbosch. The apartment was in a secure complex. There was a security gate and electrified wire around the facility. It was newly constructed, and not all the units were finished, but Inga made sure that these security features were completed before moving into her apartment. The apartment was about 30 minutes from where her parents lived. Inga was close to her parents and spent a lot of time at their residence despite having her own apartment. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On March 11, 2005, when Inga was at her parents' home, her mother noticed that she had bruises on her arm. Inga changed her clothing to cover the bruises. On March 13, Fred asked if he could visit Inga at her parents' home, but she did not seem interested. Fred visited the home anyway. On the evening of March 15, Fred spent the night in Inga's apartment, which was not out of the ordinary, but it seems unusual based on their beliefs about temptation. On the morning of March 16, 2005, Fred and Inga had an argument. Fred said that he was upset about a disagreement with his brother, but Inga believed that Fred was upset about their relationship and became concerned about their future together. She asked Fred if he still loved her. Fred said that he did, but he believed that she may not be in love with him. So both people believed that the other one wasn't committed to the relationship. Fred told Inga to record her feelings in writing, and they would talk about the situation later. Fred left the apartment and drove to his college campus to attend a class. Inga wrote a two-page letter and was getting ready to take it to Fred 
when a contractor arrived to fix broken tiles on her balcony. The tiles had been broken when the movers carried her couch into the apartment. Apparently, it would not fit through the front door. Inga told the contractor that she was leaving and asked if he could come back later. Inga drove to the campus and gave the letter to Fred. This was at about 10 a.m. She did not stay long. After this, Fred drove to a furniture store and picked up an item for a friend. He then made his way to his job in Cape Town, arriving just after 11 a.m. Inga left the campus and had lunch with a childhood friend. She told the friend that the fight between her and Fred was severe, and she thought the relationship was over. At 1.15 p.m., Inga arrived back at her apartment. The contractors were there, she let them in, and they completed the work. Inga was on the phone with her mother, Juanita, when the contractors were leaving. Juanita said that she heard Inga walk the contractors to the door and lock the security gate behind them. At 1.36 p.m., Inga sent a text message to Fred. It was the last message he would receive from her. At 2.55 p.m., Inga purchased a hamburger from a fast food restaurant, which was about three miles from her apartment. She walked to a grocery store and purchased a soda and magazine. This was right next to the restaurant. After this, she walked to a video rental store, which was also right in that same area, and rented the movie The Stepford Wives. This was at 3.07 p.m. It is believed that after Inga left the video rental store, she drove straight to her apartment and changed into pajama shorts. At some point around this time, Inga was bludgeoned and stabbed to death as she sat on her couch. There were no witnesses to the crime. Her body would remain undiscovered for several hours. Fred left work at 6.07 p.m. and went back to his apartment. He had dinner with his roommate, Marius. After dinner, they dropped off the piece of furniture that Fred had picked up earlier that day. Not long after 8 p.m., Fred sent a text message to Inga. She did not respond. He tried calling at 9 p.m. and 9.03 p.m. There was no answer. At 9.40 p.m., he sent another text message, but there was still no response. Fred called Inga's mother at 10 p.m. and expressed his concern about not being able to reach his girlfriend. Eight minutes later, Fred called Inga's phone for the last time. After failing to get a response, Fred wanted to check up on Inga in person. His roommate, Marius, came up with the idea of contacting a mutual friend of theirs named Christo Pretorius because he lived close to Inga. The plan was for Christo to check on Inga as Fred made his way to her family home to pick up the remote control for the gate at the apartment complex. No one had keys to Inga's apartment door except for Inga because the locks had just been changed on March 15, a day earlier. But at least the remote control would get Fred into the complex. At 10.30 p.m., Christo arrived at Inga's apartment complex. He buzzed her apartment, but received no response. He called out to a neighbor he saw standing on a balcony. The neighbor opened the security gate. Christo made his way to Inga's apartment and knocked on a door, but received no answer. He noticed through a window that the lights were off in the apartment, but the TV was on. He decided to try the door. It was unlocked. When he opened the door, he saw Inga on the couch, covered in blood. He went to a neighbor and told them to call the police. Christo believed that Inga had brought an end to her own life, but of course, that's not what happened. Here's what the police found during their investigation. Inga was on the couch when she was killed. She was bludgeoned and stabbed 47 times. Some of her wounds were defensive. She was reading a magazine and watching the DVD when she was attacked. The remote control for the television was still in her hand. There was no forced entry into her apartment. Only two items had been stolen. A knife, presumably the one that was used to stab her, and a remote control for the security gate. There was blood in the bathroom, as if the killer cleaned up before leaving. There was one bloody mark on the bathroom floor, which the police believed could have been from a shoe. The case for the DVD had fingerprints on it. The electricity to the complex had been disconnected for a few hours that day due to construction work, so perhaps somebody gained entry during that time. The police never bothered to follow up with any of the construction workers. They were positive that whoever killed Inga 
must have known her. Considering there was no forced entry, Inga must have let the killer into the apartment. And she was wearing a t-shirt and pajama shorts, which she probably would not have worn in front of a stranger. About two weeks into the investigation, the police stumbled on what they believed to be a lucky break. A 17-year-old drug dealer confessed to the murder, but then changed his story, saying he witnessed other people commit the murder. Either way, the police believed that they had solved the murder. The drug dealer knew Inga had been found on a couch, which was not released to the public. However, he was unable to tell the police where her apartment was located, and he said the murder occurred on a Saturday, when in fact it had occurred on a Wednesday. He recanted his confession, saying that he was on drugs. The drug dealer was convicted of burglary unrelated to the murder and sentenced to 11 years in prison. The police decided to focus the investigation on Fred. He was arrested for Inga's murder. Fred's murder trial lasted for nine months. In South Africa, there is no jury. A judge decides the verdict. In 2007, the judge found Fred not guilty. Fred sued the government for millions of dollars and won. He said that it was a malicious prosecution, but the decision was overturned, so he ended up with nothing. Now moving to my analysis. Was Fred Van de Viver guilty of murder? Despite being found not guilty, investigators consider this case closed. They believe Fred was the killer. Others believe that Fred could not have committed the murder. Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Fred was guilty, starting with the inculpatory evidence. Investigators said that one of the fingerprints from the DVD case matched Fred's. When the police searched Fred's residence, they found sneakers that had recently been cleaned. They claimed that the sneakers matched the marks in blood on the bathroom floor. Fred had a hammer slash bottle opener in his vehicle. It was a gift from Inga's parents. Expert witnesses from the prosecution argued this tool was consistent with Inga's wounds. On the day Inga was murdered, Fred did not make any calls or use his computer between 3.29 p.m. and 5.14 p.m. Perhaps he left work, killed Inga, and returned to work. Fred and Inga had a history of arguing and had an intense argument on the day she was killed. Fred refused to show Inga's mother the two-page letter that Inga had written. Instead, he showed her a short, undated note. The two-page letter contained statements which appeared to be related to infidelity or perceived infidelity, like Inga was trying to convince Fred that she was not cheating on him. Fred appeared to be manipulative, controlling, and violated boundaries, like when he visited the home of Inga's parents in order to see Inga, despite her lack of interest. Fred was particularly worried that something happened to Inga, despite the fact that she would frequently study with her phone set on silent. Why was he so persistent about getting in contact with Inga on that particular night? Now moving to the exculpatory factors. A drug dealer confessed to witnessing other people commit the murder, although he later recanted. The fingerprint, which was supposedly from the DVD case, may have been lifted from a curved surface, like a glass. Defense experts testified that it looked like that. It was also not labeled properly by the police. No further examination of the DVD case was possible because the police actually returned the DVD to the rental store. I guess they didn't want to pay a late fee. To be fair, in keeping with the theme of South Africa, late fees there are murder. Defense experts testified that the blood on the bathroom floor did not match Fred's sneakers and the marks may have not been caused by a shoe print. It looked like perhaps a tool was put on the floor, and that is what left the marks. Defense experts said that the hammer slash bottle opener did not match Inga's wounds, and it did not have her blood or DNA on it. As far as Fred being inactive on electronic devices at work for an hour and 45 minutes, this is a very tight window to commit this crime. The driving distance between Cape Town and Stellenbosch is 40 minutes. The walk to Fred's pickup truck was five minutes. So this meant that simply getting to Inga's apartment and back to his job would have taken 90 minutes. This leaves Fred only 15 minutes to commit the murder and clean up. 
In addition, his co-worker said that he didn't look like he just committed murder. Again, considering the popularity of homicide in South Africa, his co-workers would have been good at recognizing the signs of someone who just committed murder. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Fred Vandeviver was guilty? No, I don't think he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. As far as being guilty in reality, I don't think that he was, but it's tough to say because I don't trust the investigation. The police did such a terrible job that it's hard to know which findings are accurate and which findings are inaccurate. The judge believed that there was no way that Fred could have been guilty because of that time frame. Fred could not have committed the murder in the short period of time when he didn't have an alibi. This seems like a reasonable conclusion. However, were the police correct about the times? Again, there's just no way to know. Fred certainly seemed like the obvious suspect. Who else could have gained access to Inga's apartment without breaking in? And to put Inga at ease to such a degree that she didn't even bother turning off her movie or stop reading her magazine. She was taken completely by surprise. Also, how many killers who are strangers to the victim would use a knife from the victim's kitchen? This happens on occasion, but it's not common. If Fred is innocent, I think the killer was probably a young man with whom Inga had romantic contact or a man who wanted romantic contact with her. Perhaps one of those contractors came back to Inga's apartment and told her that they needed to check one more item that they missed earlier, or they were there to retrieve a tool that they left behind. Inga went back to what she was doing as the contractor did some work. Then the contractor murdered her. If the police had conducted a proper investigation, perhaps justice could have been done in this case. Inga was victimized once by her killer and a second time by terrible police work. There's one last area I want to cover. It's only tangentially related to this case. I mentioned earlier that South Africa has a very high murder rate. I was thinking that their current slogan, Inspiring New Ways, doesn't really capture the essence of the tourism experience in the country. So I thought they could create a new slogan, perhaps one inspired by slogans from other countries. This would just be easier than inventing a new one from scratch. Here's what I came up with. Denmark's slogan is the happiest place on earth. South Africa could adapt that to the deadliest place on earth. This still has a mystique to it. People wouldn't necessarily know that the word deadly is applied to the tourists. Latvia has a catchy slogan, best enjoyed slowly. This could be modified for South Africa to best enjoyed eternally. Luxembourg has a slogan, live your unexpected Luxembourg. For South Africa, this could be changed to, if you live, it is unexpected. My final slogan idea is taken from Nepal. Their slogan is, once is not enough. South Africa could convert this to, once is all you get. Those are my thoughts in the case of Inga Lotz. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.